Okay, we're live. Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to the fourth installment in our series on competence and dog training. Um, and I do want to start by just briefly saying that we do take pains here in these discussions to not have them become bash sessions, primarily avoiding ad hominem attacks and sticking to the issues and events. In this issue, we're going to wrestle with the question of how to help trainers up their game. And the first question is, is how, you know, how do we do this? Because we do not have the answers, but we do want to raise the, the issue um, of competence. Um, and so, you know, how do we address it um, if, if people don't already get it and are, don't already recognize that they're not fully trained? You know, what can we do or what can anybody do if you suspect incompetence in a colleague? Right. So I think originally we were sort of discussing this and, and, you know, I think we all don't really have a good, you know, and correct me if I'm wrong panel, but we don't have a, a strong sense amongst us. Is it actually our job? Um, so we are, as Emily said earlier, our, our profession is a bit of a dumpster fire because there is no governing body and no standards of care. Um, and I think anyone who is on the team of the academy and the team of positive reinforcement trainers everywhere will sort of agree that that there's some harm being done to dogs by our profession, um, both by incompetence and also by you know trainers who make use of uh, aversive tools and techniques. Um, so you know because we're trained in human behavior change, or we should be if we're competent trainers, um, could we? Oh, sorry. No, what's going on with my camera? Could we? Um, take on the role of trying to change people's behavior? Is that something that we should do? We know how to change people's behavior, um, but is it our role to, you know, like oversee our colleagues? And and I just, I don't know. It's too exhausting, um, you know? I mean, there should, it is, be, it can be. should be bodies doing, doing that. Like, but like there, there isn't. Doing... And so here we are, you know? And I, I, I can think of many cases, you know, where my colleagues um, have had other trainers come to them and say, can you mentor me? Can you give me sort of an idea about my own lack of strengths? Um, that kind of thing. And I think when that comes up in that particular sort of relationship between two people, then yes, I mean, that's wonderful. And that, you know, there's this open door because somebody's literally asking uh, for help. But if you're in a situation where someone doesn't have an idea about their own incompetence, if they're actively harming, say, puppies um, in a puppy class where they're not letting them play freely, you know, where they're they're using negative reinforcement on puppies. Um, like these are things that are obviously dangerous and <clears throat> are signs of incompetence. Do we have a role? How do we should we be sort of interacting with these people? How, is that at all possible? Should we? I don't know. I mean, it really does sometimes feel like, you know, you can't offer unsolicited advice to people who don't want your advice. I mean, it's just, you know, it's just that yeah. it, it, this is a non-starter. But but what do we do? I mean, I'm, and I think it's a, a greater conversation. Um, there are, there are, they're not governing bodies, but they're um, associations, they're trainers associations. Um, and I wonder if maybe starting from within those, coming up with ideas like checklists, um, data collection um, recommendations for all trainers, um, you know, how do you, you know, do you know the outcome for, for your cases? Um, do you know, how to follow up and keep good records because you should have some indication um especially early on we were very um careful that you know what was the outcome of this case how many visits were there um we kept records for that reason so that we could get a better gauge on how we were doing especially early in our career where we didn't have much to compare it to um and i wonder if maybe helping folks or at least having that available to folks whether they're in you know the ppg or you know CCP, cptt or any of those organizations where i mean in the academy we have those wonderful self-evaluation forms as students where we're supposed to be filming ourselves and using checklists to make sure that we are adhering to really good you know solid criteria um that we're covering the parameters we need to um, and boy, was that ever helpful. I don't, you know, I don't know about, about you guys, but I found that extreme painful, but helpful. Um, I also, I'm a huge uh, believer in, in follow-up, um, part, you know, there's two sort of things, there's kind of two cans of worms. One is, 
um, follow-ups in general that you you check on your cases. And some people don't like doing it because, you know, of course, we're very busy and it takes time and, and it's hard to sort of chase people down at, you know, I used to do six month, one year, two year follow-ups after cases were concluded because I wanted to know whether what I was doing was working. Um, and this was sort of back, you know, the, the old days um, where there, there, there weren't as, I mean, it, when we say there's no standards of care, but there kind of are standards of care that, you know, we, we, you know, don't use aversives. Um, and then there's some, some that you know are, are not our topic for today but you know stuff like lima um or, or where you're supposed to you know do these things uh in in certain orders um but in those days it really was just you know you just you, I, I was making it up from first principles um and didn't know whether what i was doing was working um and so i i wanted to do follow-up because i i wanted to know and i'm puzzled um by practitioners who don't want to know um who aren't burning to know whether what they did worked, uh, yeah. because if it's not working, then you have the opportunity to, 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 to say, okay, this, you know, I'm using, this is the technique I did on, here's these case types. I've been using this technique. I've been counseling thus. Here are the outcomes, you know, and you can define the outcome. Dog, you know, I used to define dog in the home. The, the client is happy with the dog. The problem has not recurred. Um, simple. So, you know, three, three questions. Um, I used to do it by phone, but now I think it probably could be done by email or forms or, or so, you know, stuff on the internet. Yeah. Um, and that's one thing you've, you've got to know whether what you're doing is, is working. Um, uh, otherwise there's no iteration. There's no right. iterative process where you can, you know, change what you're doing and improve and, and, you know, craft your, your interventions. And the other thing that I think we talked a little bit about before we went on air here is um, one and dones, which is, you know, the doing a single consult, you know, with a massive sort of report afterwards, and then off you go client, do it yourself without, you know, follow up. Um, and and um, I don't know if, you know, people have feels about that. I mean, sometimes I think trainers think it's client driven that clients can't afford or do not want to have multiple uh, sessions in, in packages and so on. I've not found that to be the case. Um, I just used to sort of insist on this is how many you know, sessions approximately minimum it takes for problem type X, mm -hmm. Y, or, or Z. So I don't know. How, what do you guys think? I historically, I'll jump in here because historically I'm, my biggest fear is seeming mercenary. So oh. I've mean, worried that I, that the person might think I'm doing a pressure. You have, you know what I mean? Type of thing. So I've always been a little too much on the, on the end of, um, no pressure. If you want a follow-up training session, I'm here. You'll have to let me know. Like, I'm not going to put any pressure on you. Go read the consult notes and then come to me with any questions. And if I, if at that point you want, you know, that's the way I've always been. Um, I don't know if it's a Gen Xer thing or, or whatever. <laughs> I think it's a human, th a human it thing yeah. to not want to appear, much to not want to appear mercenary and end up underserving the client. Can you imagine if surgeon said, I don't want to appear mercenary. So I'm going to use the cheap cheap stuff in your knee replacement because I don't know right. right and and it's interesting because John was never that way um and Allison so um Allison McConnell who's an academy grad and one of my um colleagues here at Dog Educated um I've never seen anybody I mean there's there have been people she's just gone back with and gone back with and they're just so you know and I think basically she ends her her visits going, okay, um, do you want to schedule for next week or two weeks? It's kind of a very simple to her. It's because she's the type of owner. That's how I met Allison. She was our client. She was the type of owner who was just like, when can you come back? And, you know, it's not because she was like swimming in money. It was because she really wanted to address the behaviors that her dog was having. And she wanted us to come back. Um, she felt that I wasn't ambitious enough to, to invite her back. We're training and later I, I should say for the record, I've never had a client, not once in, in 35 years or whatever, say, you know, it ended up being superf I mean, sort of comments they put or or to me or in a review or anything, say, you know, it was actually superfluous all those sessions. Yeah, I've never, never had, not once. So, you know, so if you do it, so if you insist on it, you, you don't end up with clients. Sort of, I think there was one, a post on that recently where somebody um, they're, you know, they got, they got that kind of feedback from a client about, well, that, that, that's pretty unusual. Yeah. Yeah. I find like, I'm a terrible, I'm terrible at selling myself. So I'm always like, you know, in the, especially in the curse. beginning, I was like, oh, you know, like you don't have to like, because I just have, 
I just don't know how to market myself well. And so to circum to get around that, I just ended up now I only sell packages um, and I sell short packages so that they're like digestible for the guardian to come into the start working with me. And then I have follow up packages that we can add. But every single one of my packages um, that it has unlimited email and, and like unlimited support. And we're meeting multiple times in the, in the month so that I don't have to sell myself. I can just, yeah. I sell the package and then I don't have to have that conversation. Those are the only choices like, on your site. You mean? Yeah. They yeah. can't just book a one, one time session with me. We're going to work together for at least a month and we're going to work together. Like, you know, some of my clients, I'm talking to them every day. Um, and that's how I had to get around that. Like, you know, it's, I think it's hard for some of us to, we're, we, again, we're dog trainers. We're not, you know, businessmen, right. Or businesswomen, I guess I should say, like, it's, it's tough if you haven't had a sales background, which I haven't. And I found that in like, you know, working for the SPCA as well, like even asking for donations or when people would donate, I was always so I, awkward. I didn't know what to say, even though it was like, it felt, it felt like I was asking for money personally. And that's just like, if you're like me, just find a way to not just sell one and done. Yeah. Pack, build like build it in, build yeah. it in so that it's not a conversation you even have to have. It's right. just, that's the option. Yeah. yeah. I, 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 I lead with that with, I mean, now I do these just, you know, chow and chow adjacent cases. And I just lead with this problem type um, needs a minimum of, of blah. And then it's just that. And if they, you know, and they sort of say anything, I just, I just sort of say, and then other words to say, oh gosh, I'm so sorry. I wasn't clear. This problem type needs a minimum of blah, you know, and, and, you know, and that, that's, it's not, I don't, it's this problem type needs. Yeah. Yeah. Cause some are going to absolutely need more than a one and done. Most. So I want to raise the question that we can talk about, you know, who it's not our, is that our, our job? Is it that whose job is it to sort of, you know, um, uh, figure figure out um and and sort of one way people can objectively self-assess is is your your case outcomes whether it's going well um and then the next way so so i do want to this is going to be a loaded question but what is more important the public safety and consumer protection in dog training or the egos of dog trainers that might be bruised by us raising the issue of of competence because it seems that We've triggered some people um, uh, who you know, somehow think that this is a question of sort of elitism or, um, uh, and, and you know, sort of, is it elitism to want basic competence in one's profession where there are, where there's public safety concerns and dog welfare concerns and so on? How is that? How is it? you know, how is it snobby or whatever to, to say, you know, we really want to have basic competence standards. I'm, I'm having a hard time digesting that. Mm. Yeah. I think we, we, I know we said this before, but we really just, in my opinion, have to bring it back down to dogs. And rather than, I think it's easy to let the sort of the, the welfare of dogs and the well being of dogs fall by the wayside side when it comes to our own feels you know, so it's instead of it being a conversation about dogs, it's easy for it to accidentally become a conversation about, well, you're making me feel like this, you know, I, but that I don't think is useful. I think we have to say, okay, well, who's really suffering here? It's going to be dogs and their guardians, you know, for suffering when we have trainers who reasonably we can all accept that there's incompetence and that it's damaging for our profession, you know, um, and therefore really dogs are the ones who are going to end up suffering and euthanized and relinquished right that that's not an overstatement you know this is happening because of problems in our profession and i also think on some level that if if we can take a step back and say okay um is it is it doing a service to our profession to try and polite our way past this you know mm -hmm. like incompetent trainers make us as competent positive reinforcement trainers look bad and you know we we see it go by in social media we see people who are now acolytes of balanced trainers because they had it they went to a positive reinforcement trainer and it didn't work um so now they're like really tooting the horn of balanced trainers it's so we're if if we sort of say oh well it's we can't bring this to the forefront. We can't talk talk about this topic. Then we're not doing ourselves any favors, you know. No, as a profession, and if shoddy work is being done, it keeps it drags down the whole profession, which which 
it, which increases the burnout burden and increases yeah. sort of the, you know, the, the, uh, we all sort of feel it in the zeitgeist that dog training is a devalued profession. And you end up with the Emily's who don't even want to, you know, I can't market myself. You know, it, it, it feeds into that, yeah. that, you know, uh, we're not, we're not competent professionals who can say, this is how, you know, this is how we is what deal what with we problem X. And this is, you know, this is how much I, I charge and, you know, and the sort of the basic things that one needs to do to survive um, as a trainer, if, if the whole profession is devalued and part of that devaluation is because there are no standards of care and there's shoddy practice going on. Um, a next topic I want to raise, which is one that, gosh, you know, it is another sort of can of worms. It's sort of the, the, the affordability. This is of, of education. This is a complex profession. And then there's the broad question of affordability of education in general, yeah. which I know, you know, uh, there's crippling student loan out there um, and sort of, and, and all kinds of conversation about the forgiving of, of student debt. Um, but generally speaking, what we're talking about is students who are paying, you know, tens of thousands of dollars per semester for a four-year college uh, court or tens of thousands of dollars a year for and plus boarding for for a four year college degree with which they may or may not get a job um, and generally speaking we're talking about much much less for the programs out there to to properly educate dog trainers but but you know there's a lot of sort of well I can't afford this and that's a reality that people are are feeling they can't afford it but then to properly train somebody the, the amount of overhead to properly train somebody in a complex profession is massive um and you know I can't speak for the other programs but but we we are not fantastically profitable we we're just we just sort of uh, we're alive um and so what 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 can be done about this you know how do we address the, the issue of people saying, I, I can't afford to become properly educated is the answer. Therefore, OK, then just do what you can and go out there and and do behavior mm -hmm. counseling. Is that the answer? It's, it's mind blowing because like I get it. I mean, like I told you guys before when we started this conversation before we were live, you know, when I 20 years ago, I was a single mom who, you know, was on income assistance. I didn't have the money to do a program like like any of the programs out there. Um, but we have to sort of rethink what we're expecting because it wouldn't be proper for me to say, well, I can't afford it. Therefore, I should be able to just, you know, make up what I want to make up about dog behavior. And so and and go forward in this profession like there has to be. And I'm not saying I have the answer. I don't have the answer, me but either. it's 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 I think it's the, what we have to keep remembering is I can't like, there's no other industry that I can think of where that's the case, where people can say, I don't want to have an education, because a lot of people say that a lot of people, it's not about not being able to afford it, it's that they don't want to spend the money, you know, or I can't afford it or whatever it is. So therefore, I'm the just not going to be an aircraft be... mechanic, right. or not gonna... yeah, aircraft mechanics or nursing or, or physiotherapy yeah, any of or... these other things where you're dealing with like living, breathing things that can, you know, have very and detrimental you can do outcomes. Harm. Well, you, can you can do, do harm harm, physical yeah. harm, emotional harm. So it's hard because I do acknowledge, like, I know, like I've been there, there are people who can't afford it. So how do we, what's that barrier and how do we get past that? But at the same time, I think we have to stop assuming that just because we have issues with that, that this industry should just be allowed to be a free for all for whoever wants to grab a leash and start yanking the dog around. Yeah, there's That's no test. Rant. <laughs> scientific accuracy um, for any of the things that I think, again, I think it goes back to there's, because there's nobody, uh, there's no accountability because there's nobody to account to um, mm -hmm. other than the clients and the dog. So I do think that it's something that would behoove, again, I know it's hard because not everyone's going to belong to these associations. They're um, all voluntary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And there's some, I wouldn't just because I don't agree on basic principles on things that have oh, nothing. Mean, yeah. Yeah. And there's the, the variant, the philosophy sort of wars uh, out there. Mm. It's just a very difficult position. I don't understand why somebody wouldn't have the intellectual curiosity about their own efficacy. Um, why wouldn't you want to know? To me, that's. Don't, yeah. Don't you want to know if it's working? Yeah. And if it's not, how can I get better? Or what do I need to do? And I do think that even folks who are not doing like the bigger programs out there. I see them doing the smaller programs. They'll spend a thousand dollars here, 
fifteen hundred dollars. Well, that's there. what I used to do. You know, I did a so I did a four year college degree, which you know cost money, um, but it was sort of tangent. You know, it was sort of adjacent. It was caught. You know, in those days, it was called comparative psychology. Now it would be called animal cognition. And then I went to I went to every se- every weekend. I was on the road going to a seminar, which was you know a few hundred bucks a pop plus travel plus two days of lost work. Um, but I did that for years. And if you add that up, I mean, it feels because it's so piecemeal. Um, it you know it it feels cheaper, but it actually was you know fair. And and then not, and a lot of it was n- not as useful as it might have been. Yep. I, that's where I think it's tough and I don't even feel comfortable. Like I've done certain programs outside of the academy um, that have been helpful. Some have been more helpful than others. Some have been completely useless. And of course I wouldn't feel comfortable um, recommending or not recommending publicly right. certain courses. So it's a difficult position because, and, and also why would anybody out there you know, take my word for it? So I don't know. I think we're just stuck. I, I think the lack of regulations that, that, we have to be accountable to ourselves or at least one another in, in a professional industry. That- yeah, but it's not, yeah, like that comes back to that original sort of question that Christy was talking about, which is, is it, is it our problem? Is it our problem to, to, to deal with this, to, you know, should we be you know, you know trying to, to, to help us that our, I mean, our jobs are already killing us. Mm-hmm. Do we also need to be trying to, you know, um, help, or address colleagues or, or raise the issue of competence and then get and then get reamed for it by the way and not <laughs> for it because that's yeah. the other thing. are bringing it up to acknowledge it as a problem and yes it is our problem it's mm. the problem it is every and it's all of our problems i mean that that's the thing is it's not just our, our problem. it's yeah. everybody's problem because the whole profession gets dragged down by incompetence right but is it our place to um talk about it I think so again by the way I do think so because I'm the one who's dealing with these dogs you know these clients that are coming to me after trainer after trainer where they were given yeah. advice or terrible advice or no yeah. advice yeah um, and I and I feel yeah, like and that we have to daily combat the zeitgeist you know which is full of just just rotten information and you know where the amount of myth busting that we have to do um is is huge but i think that's in every profession i mean even physicians have got to deal with the amount of voodoo out there um to do with health and and so on um yeah. from a- everything from anti-vaxxers to um we should all be you know pouring C- cbd oil into our ears and and whatever the only difference there though is that the doctors don't have to like self-police their own industry like we had that very doctor here where I live and the other doctors, you know, they didn't have to go and say like, Hey, you know, sorry, I don't want to like ruffle any feathers and like, you know, <laughs> tiptoe around and it. They, they just, that guy malpractice insurance, that guy's license is gone. He's no longer allowed. And that, that came from his governing body. Right. So it's like, this is the, this is the problem with us is like, and, and, and is it even like, I don't even think it's going to be efficient for us to be policing it ourselves. Like there has to be some, there just has to be change. This industry needs to change on some and, level. You know, and, every, and I know what everybody's going to say, and we're going to say it too, which is, so who polices whom, um, mm-hmm. you know, how, how does that work and be careful what we wish for, because you know, what, what if we end up, but, but the status quo is, is not working well for dogs. It's not working well for guardians. It's not working well for professionals. Um, and, yeah, and I know that, you know, and change is so hard. Um, it just is. I would say if a colleague comes to you, this would be, this would be my approach. If a colleague comes to me with a very clearly open question and sort of open heart, ready for a uh, discussion, I would, instead of just being a friend, I would step into like behavior, like a B mod relationship with them. Um, so bringing out specific praise do you know what i'm saying like i wouldn't just be like yeah you suck at x y z you know i'd be like i would i would treat that as a professional relationship probably <clears throat> um if a colleague has not come to me and i see incompetence what i do is i for me this works for me i dri myself so i say okay i see someone so lisa's example earlier was someone who was using negative reinforcement on puppies i would create a bit of content for my facebook page on why we don't use negative reinforcement on puppies or how to pick a good puppy class and and publish that. And so I feel like I get a little bit of that Mm -hmm. need to educate out and it combats. So I'm 
skipping over my colleague and going right to the consumer and saying, hey, just so you know, you probably, if this is in your puppy class, this is a bit of a red flag. You know, it's a very it's sort of, and it's a constructive approach. And it works for me. And it, I think if every time I saw an incompetent trainer posting something or discussing something, if I tried to interact with them, I would quit. I'd be burnt. I'd be, it would be bad. Right. Be also, it's kind of a jerk way of approaching yeah. life, <laughs> so, but I don't think I could stay in the profession like that. So this gives me a way to sort of you know, in my own way, overcome my feelings of like, oh my God, our profession, um, but also try and combat the issue of competence positively. And that brings me sort of to, I think, our final topic, which is one that may be a little bit more positive because this is very gloomy and doomy. Um, the, the taking delight in referring, recognizing our specialties, recognizing our biases, recognizing our areas of of, uh, of failure, um, and that we can delight in referring. And I I delight in in referring so many cases because it's it's not in my wheelhouse or some not something I'm properly trained to do. Mm -hmm. I'm not properly trained to do separation anxiety. Um, and, you know, I just you just refer them out. There's there's a, a an army of competent separation anxiety practitioners to refer to, um, and, and that's something that we should feel relieved about rather than yeah we embrace yeah. right right. I do feel relieved. I am a CSAT. I am a separate specialist, but because I do so many in-person type, you know, uh, you know, case types, I, how grateful I am to know so many um, people who specialize in, in, in um, you know, have done those programs for separation anxiety. Um, and I can, you know, give their names and know people are going to be in the greatest hands. Not only do I know that they're going to be in competent hands, but I know exactly how the training is going to go because I personally did the, one of those programs. Um, so yeah, I think it's a beautiful thing. And I tell people when they email me, if I don't have room to take a Sepang's case, I'm going to refer you on here is a list of extremely competent, um, lovely Sepang's trainers. Um, I very strongly urge you to select one of these people rather than going for somebody random. In a yeah. I mean, I, I, I absolutely will not refer unless they are a graduate of, um, a CSAT via Milena Price or Julie Nason in this program, um, period. You yeah. know, and, and so and those are sort of like, you know, sort of like, like, um, um, you know, the gold seal, the good housekeeping seal of, you know, you know, this is, is, is going to be, we're going to be know, good. And then if I, you know, and I happen to know some, a lot of them personally, and I know how good they are. So that helps too. But the, but the, but the basic bar to, you know, entry is, is having um, successfully completed one of those specialty programs. And people do come back to me um, to report back. Um, on their experience with those trainers and they're always right. such they rave about it they're grateful that they had such a good experience I am so grateful to those right. trainers whether it's about setbacks or kids and dogs or dog dog um, they always come back to say this person was phenomenal thank you so much um, for referring and do you know what that like I feel like I did something super special right I feel you directed you direct yeah, it's sort of a wilderness out there and you were able to <clears throat> direct somebody to to good so all services. The noise, all the mess. These people came to me looking for help. I got them to help, even if I couldn't get them on my schedule for not to take the case. Um, I feel just as much gratification at those response those yeah. follow-up emails as I yeah, do. Yeah, it's like the, it's the the helper impulse that we all got into this profession with, you know, it get gets, you know, it it, it just ah, I help. It's relief. I think something else that might be in the future, if we can sort of pull up our socks in the competence game as trainers, is being able to work sort of in a more collegial environment with other dog professionals like veterinarians. And I think instead of being like a single person in a silo helping a dog, being able to be collegial with the vets and other trainers. So say you have a specialist working on a dog set banks, but they're also leash reactive or stranger danger being able to work collegially with our colleagues because we share is that is really nice. So I think that's something that that we can look forward to more and more, you know, if 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 our profession can progress in this aspect. Agreed. Any final thoughts? Emily, I was hoping you were going to say take the effing babies, but 
Well, take the, take the babies, <laughs> take all the babies. Yeah. We had that conversation. <laughs> I think what was that a couple months ago? Some people and, you know, love doing kids and dogs. Some people don't love doing kids and dogs. And, they, no. and there's also, this also, this also sort of specialty programs out there to help you with kids and dogs. Yes. Yeah. I yeah. will not handle any case with kids, anything that involves babies, toddlers, or like little children in the home with and it's dogs. Fine. You refer them out. Yeah. And the weird, like, this is where I think we have to like, look at our own competence. It's not that I don't know how to resolve those cases. I, and I also like raised my child, by the way, with like a whole bunch of pit bulls and we worked in pit bull rescue. So we had a whole bunch of like random dogs in the house all the time. Never had a problem. I was really good at that even before I was a trainer, but the concept of someone else's child and a dog and I'm, I'm so worried about the baby or the, the toddler, I will not be able to handle that case properly because I'm going to say like, don't let the dog anywhere near the baby, even though that's not even how I, I raised my son, but that's my, <laughs> that's not my competence in that moment talking. That's my, um, you know, my worry and all of my thoughts and feelings about it and like all the things that could possibly go wrong and everything, kind you know, of, kind of like, you know, family members, like, you know, sometimes I don't know if it's still the case that physicians are told to, you know, be careful about treating family members or operating our family members, or, you know, sort of like that, that you, if you're, if you're emotional about something and biases creep into Interesting, much, yeah. you lose your professional ob objectivity, yeah. which is so vital. I'm not going to be able to, I'm going to be able to keep the baby safe, but I'm not going to give them the best most Possible realistic service. outcome. And I think that they could have a much more cohesive family. So I refer that out. And it's not that I'm incompetent on my skill set. It's that my bias makes me un un incompetent. And I recognize that. So we do have this joke, like take the effing babies. Like I don't want, if it has anything to do with a, a toddler <laughs> or a baby, like I'm, I'm so happy to, re I can't hit like the refer button fast enough on those cases, like take them. And it's fine. Yeah. And it's, it's fine. fine. Yeah. And it feels good. Yeah. Actually, uh, You know, in the Academy, we've got that group, my own Academy dog for the same freaking reason. Yeah. When it you, lo you lose your mind when it's your own yeah, dog. You mm -hmm. sense of, um, um, I, I'm not using, I'm not finding words today, but uh, it's so good to have other eyes on it. So, because it's so yeah. hard when in the midst of it um you're less objective i think and you and you're you forget everything you know it's like spills out of your head so you need your colleagues just to to kind yeah. of get you on track um that should that could be a whole a whole thing too well thank you um panel as always um my esteemed colleagues christy benson academy staff Lisa skavinsky of dog educated in rochester new york emily Priestley, wild at heart dog training in the greater victoria british columbia um, we will be back um, uh, probably in February or March with another series. Um, so watch this space and thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.